If you found the problem, should you work on the solution? Stay tuned and find out. Okay, here's the question. How are we dark horses? You know, the ones everyone is betting against, the ones they don't expect to win, place, or even show on the track, and they'll even laugh on us when we talk about trying. How do we show the world our greatness and triumph? Come on. Well, that's the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. This is The Dark Horse Entrepreneur. My name is Tracy Brinkman. And push it up. What is up? What is up? What is up, my dark horse friends and family? Welcome back to your weekly dose of lion or sheep learning. I'm your dark horse host, Tracy Rearman, and you, well, that, my friends, is infinitely more important. You are a driven entrepreneur or business owner, or perhaps you're one in the making. Either way, you're here because you're ready to start, restart, kickstart, and just start leveling up with some great marketing, personal, or business tips and results in order to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it absolutely deserves to be. And man, do I have a big episode for you. You know, I say that every single week and I believe it. I believe every time I bring one of these amazing folks onto the show that it is a big episode. And today, David King is going to be sharing the effects of having things all bottled up. Why? doing something beyond yourself is a good thing. What you should do if you find a problem, the power of your beliefs and values, and why he is going to be your next lieutenant governor. Well, he will be if you live in Wisconsin anyway. Plus, I'm going to let you in on a little sneak peek on next week's interview guest who was or has served as a vice president or directorship roles for multiple Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 companies. So as per usual, the dark horse corrals are chock full of personal business and marketing G-O-L-D spilling from every corner of the dark horse entrepreneur HQ. So let's get to the starting gates and go. All right, my Dark Horse friends and family, like I mentioned earlier, today's guest is David King. Now, David, after a decade of serving uh, as a neighborhood security aide and managing multiple businesses in Milwaukee, made his way down to Georgia, where he helped a local ministry implement a youth center program. And then he made his way back to Milwaukee, where he established a prison ministry with the goal of rehabilitating prison inmates. And then... King managed a transitional living facility. Uh, I believe that one was named the Mountain of the Lord House. This institution offered counseling, social assistance, and spiritual guidance for men, including former inmates, drug addicts, and the homeless. Soon after that, he started a transitional home for single mothers called the Lord House of Rest, with the goal of encouraging these single mothers to become spiritually strong and gain and maintain social economic independence, power, seeing problems, fixing them. He expanded his ministry enterprise in uh, 2001 with SWEEP, which is an acronym for Soldiers Walking, Evangelizing, and Empowering People. This was a community justice center which helped p- uh, place individuals in employment and provided secured housing. These are all the things that so many people have been busting their buns getting the government to try and do. And this man was out there doing it himself. Now, I don't want to give all the way the goodness here, but man, we have to hear this story. All right, Mr. King, man, so glad to have you here on the Dark Horse Entrepreneur. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, and it's a, it's an honor to be here with you, sir. Oh, it's really my pleasure. I know I have seen you at a at a number of events here recently over the past few months. Um, I think the first time I saw you, we were at that 9-11 rally up here in Washington County, and you came over to the table, introduced yourself, and you were chatting with my wife and I about some of the things that you believe need to be happening in our great state, right? Yes, yes, most definitely. You so know. Um, I, I want to hush my mouth here, and I want you to tell your story, um, you know, like, we were, like I was just telling you, that good, the bad, the ugly, the, everything that kind of brought you to where you are today and you know and then why you're 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 doing what you're doing which in this case is is running for lieutenant governor okay well i'm gonna start the story off this way 
Um, from the age of nine to 11, I was being molested by four different men. Mm -hmm. And um, nobody knew about it. it. It was bottled up inside of me for over 21 years. Wow. And, and so by, by it being bottled up, it started to just try to come out. And, and when it was trying to come out, I try to suppress it with drugs and everything. And, and I didn't want to have to dress it and deal with it. And, and it got to a point where it looked at like I destroyed my life totally. Mm -hmm. So on January 4th, 1992, I was standing on a bridge downtown Milwaukee getting ready to jump. Oh, I don't know how to swim. So it would have been easy for me. Um, but when I, Looked down to jump. All I saw was my daughter's faces. Mm. I didn't see no water. I just saw my daughter's faces. And out of nowhere, in the middle of the night, a bus came. And, and the bus picked me up. And I got on the bus and I turned myself into the mental hospital. I said I wasn't, uh, I, I, I'm not... I'm not safe right now because I want to do some things to myself. And, and because it was volunteer, I didn't have to stay long, but I, I ended up there and got out the mental hospital. I was a cook at the time um, out in Brookfield. I was a cook um, for Applebee's and I was about to hit one of the wildest parties of my life. And I mean, wow, you know, one, you, you know, back in 90s, you know, those were some wild parties. And oh, yeah. So I was about to hit a wild party. I mean, I, I ended up um, marketing myself with the waitress at, 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 at the job, you know, and saying, when we get to this party, girl, once you go black, you never go back. <laughs> and, I mean, it was it was going to be. Drinking, drugs, and sex. That's the kind of party it was going to be. All right. And I go home to, uh, to try to get ready for the party, and my car wouldn't start. Mm. And none of my friends would take me into Brookfield in the 90s because we knew we was going to get pulled over for driving black. Sure. And so nobody wanted to go out there. The uh, Yellow Cab Company told me they're not taking me out that far. They wasn't going to take me out there. So I couldn't get to the party. I called my friend that I worked with and said, man, send somebody down to come get me. Um, my car won't start. He said, nope, get here. And when you get here, you can spend a night and we can all go to work together because everybody worked. We all work there. Sure. And so I'm like, OK, so I'm sitting in and in, in, I'm standing in the window getting mad because I couldn't get to this party. I knew what was going to be at this party. <laughs> and I, I couldn't get out the party. And out of my belly said, I guess I'll go to church in the morning. And I'm sitting there like, where did that come from? And I ended up going to bed and I woke up that morning and I looked at the clock. And when I looked at the clock, um, it said, it, it, you know, it was still early. I said, I ain't going to church. I'm just going to lay in the bed. And I laid in the bed and a loud voice came out out of nowhere and said, get up and go to church. And I got up and I joined church and I've been in church ever since. Mm. Turned you around, did it? Turned me totally around. But at the time, I was still hard headed. You know, God was trying to deal with me. Yep. And, and, and in the process of God dealing with me, I ended up in a fight with God and I lost. And so uh, it's funny how we try to tell God what we ain't going to do. And he says, oh, OK, I'll just show you what you're going to do. So I ended up he called me into the ministry. I ended up spending three years in Georgia uh, learning ministry and everything. And then I came back to Milwaukee. I went to Georgia in 93 and I came back in 96. Um, ready to do whatever God wanted to do. I started pastoring the church in 98. Um, I was running a transitional home for men that was getting off drugs, coming out of um, prison and everything. And then I opened up a transitional home for single moms to help them get back on their feet. I was doing prison ministry at the time. And then we opened up what's called a community justice center. And the Community Justice Center was 
uh, right above my church where people could come in and get jobs and get the help they needed, whatever they needed help with. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, God started showing me to study government. And I started studying government. And I saw how this country was orchestrated by God to be formed. And so it was amazing to me that even, even the oldest church in Savannah, Georgia, the oldest black church in Savannah, Georgia, before I started studying in government, was offered to me to pastor, but I refused. But when I started studying government, I realized that that oldest church was part of history. Mm -hmm. Because Adam uh, Adam uh, went to Georgia and helped start that church. And so I was sitting there like, oh my God, really? It, it just started blowing my mind. And then I started seeing the politics in Milwaukee and how they were just oppressing the people. And um, my spiritual father had a, a saying that um, if, if you come up with the problem, I charge you to the solution. There it is. So I jumped in a primary in 2008. I jumped in a Democrat primary knowing I wasn't a Democrat. They knew I wasn't a Democrat uh, the way I spoke. And so they spent a lot of money in that race because I picked the weakest Democrat to go after. Sure. And, and I didn't know nothing about running for office. I didn't know nothing about politics or anything like that. So there was this guy, he came in the inner city and he grabbed a, a lot of, of um, blacks that, was, that wanted to run. And he says, I'll take care of y'all printing and everything. But what he did was he made everybody printing look the same. Like we was a group of candidates and stuff. And I was like, wait a minute, I don't do this. I, I'm, I'm my own man. I'm not going to sing nobody else's song. I'm not going to do anything. I, and I walked out of the meeting. I'm like, no, I'm not doing it. And I walked out. Well, when I walked out, I met a man by the name of Mark Block. Mark Block came out of the meeting and caught up with me and said, wait, I want to talk to you. And I was like, what? And he says, uh, I believe in what you're doing. He says, let's ride. So I, I ride around with him. And he took me around a lot of conservative people, right? He took me around. Uh, he took me to this thing called a hot air balloon that American for Prosperity was doing. And Vicki McKenna was speaking at the time. And I was listening to Vicki and said, oh, my God, it's a woman that sound like me. And, <laughs> and she just kept on talking. So after it was after she got through speaking, I told Mark, I'll be black. I'll be back. And I walked up to Vicky and, and it was so funny because she thought here this tall black guy coming out of her. Right. And I walked up to her and I hugged her and I said, I am so glad to meet you. You is awesome. And she was like, oh, wow. OK. So, <laughs> you know, because she said she thought I was a black liberal. She thought I was coming after her. I was right. Like, I'm like, no. So then he took me to a chicken burn. And I'm like, OK, what's a chicken burn? So I goes over there to this chicken burn and he was like, speak. And I, they let me speak and I spoke on why I'm running. And then they said, you in a Democrat primary? And I'm like, yes. They was like, you ain't no Democrat. I said, I know that. <laughs> so, so then, so then that's when my um, political side started kicking in. And then in 2009, Mark Block and American for Prosperity had an event called Defending the American Dream Summit. And I spoke there and I shared with the people, I said, listen, the country is in a condition it's in because you who claim to be believers, you who claim to be, to, to be belonging to God, you're not voting the way you're supposed to be voting. And this is why our country is in the mess that is in. It's our fault because if every believer would vote the way that they claim to they believe, then we wouldn't have all this mess that we have. Right. I yeah. said, but because you guys are more loyal to a party than you are to your God, this is why we got what we got. Okay. And I and I always said it from there until today, God didn't put none of these people in office. God allowed these people in office because you allowed them in office. Right. So 
So from 2009, um, I was up in uh, Boston Lake. I was up in Boston Lake and um, I had to speak. So I spoke and then everybody started walking up to me and says, you'll be a great secretary of state. You got my support. You'll be a great secretary of state. And I'm looking around like, who told y'all I'm running for secretary of state? <laughs> Mark Black standing in the background laughing because he said, I wanted to test the waters. And he went around and he asked everybody there, would you support him if he ran for secretary of state? Mm -hmm. So I ran for secretary of state in 2010. Now, the weird part about that is this. It was a Republican landslide. And I was the only Republican didn't win my race at that time. Mm. And I had more votes than Tom Barrett did, who ran for governor on the Democrat side. And if you go back and look at the numbers, Tom Barrett barely made a million. The person that ran against J.B. Von Holland that year had about 900,000. The person who ran for treasurer had... 800,000. My opponent had more votes than Tom Barrett. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not no. buying it. <laughs> I'm not buying it. And so, but the party didn't say anything about that. Gotcha. They just they just let it go. And, you know, I, I have my theory on why. Maybe because I'm uncontrollable. Maybe because I wouldn't be that sheep and just go along with everybody. And, mm, right. Uh, and or maybe they just couldn't control me. So they figure, you know, well, we can we ain't got nothing for the secretary of state to do in no way. So we can just leave it and don't even challenge it. And right. they didn't challenge it. So. Coming to today, well, let, let me go back. Um, I'm running an organization by Wisconsin called Wisconsin God Squad. And in, in Wisconsin God Squad, we help thousands of people in the city of Milwaukee get jobs. At one time, we transported 450 a day to work without even touching any government money. Nice. So we 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 did that. We we uh, we had a a division that dealt with the youth. And on Friday nights, we would have what we call Friday night gospel hip hop, and we would let the young people come in and listen to gospel rappers. Then we will cut off the rapping and we'll deliver a sermon message to them, offer Christ to them, and then we'll let them close out with gospel rap. Nice. And then, and, and then we uh, we had a, 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 an evangelistic tool that we used to use called the Midnight Raid, where we would walk the streets from midnight to three o'clock in the morning sharing the gospel of Christ. Okay, so those are some of the works that I've done in the city. But now let's come to today. I look at everything that's going on. I look at you got people fighting for their medical freedom, mm -hmm. stopping the mandates, the shutdown that happened in 2020, um, parents and their rights with the schools and, and all this transgender stuff where boys are putting on skirts and going in the girls' bathroom right. and, and raping some of the girls in those bathrooms. That, there it is. And and so so you, you got all of this stuff going on. And and you got an election coming up, and the 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 side that we're that we lean to, all right, the Republican side that we lean to, based on our values and all of this, right? Um, have we been voting in sheep and no lions? Yes. And so I'm like, okay, it's time for a lion to get in this race. If, if we ever going to put God back in government, we got to put a man of God or a woman of God that is bold enough to stand up for God, even in government. Because uh, Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, uh, I'll be ashamed of you. And I skipped some of that on purpose. Right. Because you got a lot of people in, 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 in government says, oh, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say I belong to Jesus. But now let me put the whole thing together. He said, if you're ashamed of me and my word. Then I'll be ashamed of you and my father. So you might say, I'm not ashamed to say I belong, I'm, that I'm, I'm a Christian, I belong to Jesus, but you're not standing on his word. Right. And yeah. that's why we need somebody that's going to stand on the word of God and represent God in government and not become um, influenced by the, the cesspool, 
but clean up the cesspool. Yeah, that's that's going to be the tough part right there is is finding the people. And, uh, you know, I know you're one of them and we we have been at events with a number of the others, you know, the the Justin Smitka's, the the Jeanette Duchesne and uh, John Wickman types of folks that are like, dude, we are done with all this mess, this noise, this medical freedom issues, my gun rights issues, the mandates, the CRT, all this. And let's not even, let's not forget to mention the election messes. Like you alluded to that with your, uh, with your previous race, uh, what, yeah. uh, 2010 race for secretary of state. I mean, we need folks to stand up uh, and and I mean just the general folks, and then other folks like yourself to run for office that will stand up in the face of the swamp. They go ahead, step into the muck, and get themselves dirty in the effort to clean things up. And and you know you're absolutely right. And and, and we but the the key to it is we need men and women of God that is not afraid to stand on the principles of God. Because if you if we just put somebody that's that claim to be bold. And, and claim to fight, then you have folks say, okay, then how much is you gonna, how much is it gonna cost you to shut up? Yeah. No, that's not, then, no, it's a good point. And, and then they, they don't, they don't brought us, they don't sold us out. Um, so we need someone that is really going to stand boldly for God and not a sellout. Now, I, I, I say this one of my opponents run around the state saying, where you been? You know, Dr. King is a good person, but where he been? Mm -hmm. Where he been in the last year? You know, and it's funny because the last year, while you guys was on one side of the state fighting, I was at the state capitol fighting. Right. I took I took church to the state capitol. You're now listening to-, to the Dark Horse Entrepreneur Podcast. I let them know you're not shutting us down. You're not muzzling us. We're not wearing the masses. We're not doing six feet. We're, 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 we belong to God. So we answer to God. So I've been fighting. And, and, and I tell people this. I'm glad you in the fight. But you waited until the fight knocked on your door. Yeah. I've been in the fight before the fight came to the door. I've been in the fight fighting against global warming, climate change, cap and trade, common core. You know, I've been in this fight a long time. And you got other people who just started the fight or got in the fight. And now I'm glad you're fighting. But don't forget the people who started the fight, who who was the trailblazers before you. Right. You, you know, and that's sometimes people forget, you know, I don't want nobody telling me what they're going to do. And they just started. I need somebody who's seasoned, who understand the fight and really going to go in and fight. Yeah, 100 percent. And I think another piece of that is just because you haven't heard of me or just because you haven't heard of, in your case, you know, Dr. King doesn't mean he hasn't been in the fight for what, 11 years or more. Um, just because it's the first time you're hearing about him doesn't mean, you know, he hasn't been in there knee deep trying to make things better. Uh, I know I just heard of you well, gosh, the last year. And so it's, it's a, it's a new experience to me, but as I learn more about you and how long you've been at the game, it's like, you almost like aspire to be that level. I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> oh, you, you there, you there. You know? <laughs> and, and the thing about it is we need someone that's going to fight for us, but then we need someone also, and, and, and I tell people this, the reason I am the best candidate for lieutenant governor is because of, 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 of two things. The first thing is I'm an adapter. I got 30 years business experience working with million dollar companies, corporate America, uh, and then another 10 years as a business coach and a business consultant. Then I got another 20 years working with companies teaching their culture to individuals that they're about to hire. Mm -hmm. So I know how to handle businesses. Um, but I also, as an adapter, been a pastor for over 20 some years. So I know how to deal with the average person and understand that we got to address their needs as more than just making sure we got numbers and that, that we keep our freedom. The second thing is we need a lieutenant governor that, that, that can not only adapt, 
But if the governor goes down, we can trust that he's going to continue to lead us in the right direction. Yeah, no, that's that's 100 percent. Yeah, cause I think that's one of the key things that people forget about. It's like, oh, you, you, this second in command that you're picking. Uh, sure, they have their own roles that they got to do from their desk. But should something happen? God forbid, um, to the governor because, you know, life happens or maybe they do something stupid and then we decide to recall them. Well, guess what happens? The second in command steps in the first command and now you're, I won't say use it. Well, you're, you're kind of stuck with that person. So you want to pick the person that should that happen. You're like, ah, oh, I have no worries about them. Yes. And that's why I tell people, don't, don't, don't support me because you like me. Support me that you have enough trust in me mm -hmm. that if the governor goes down, I can lead the ship and and I will lead it the way the people want it led. Now, right. this, this is what I said in London, in New London the other night. I said, listen, we here speaking at your forum because we in an interview process. You guys are the boss. And you and, and I say the people cannot forget that they are the boss. Mm -hmm. So we're in it. You guys, we are interviewing from you guys and you need to understand qualification. You need to understand all of our qualifications. And, 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 and I say it all the time. You guys vote in a Republican and you went to Disney World. And when you went to Disney World, they made all kind of laws against you. That's why you're fighting for medical freedom. That's why you're fighting for um, uh, parents' rights again. That's why right. you're fighting to get certain books out of the school system. That's mm -hmm. why you're fighting. Why? Because of the fact that you put a person in office, but you didn't check their character to see if they belong to God. And if they really belong to God, they will always stand out and not stand in the crowd. They'll be right. away from the crowd. I tell people all the time, I'm like a salmon. I swim upstream. I don't swim downstream. <laughs> I like that. And I, and I think to add on to that, I think one of the things that a lot of folks um, have done, I think it's been, it, it's starting to shift now. And I, I know I'm guilty of this, so I have no problem admitting this, is that I'd vote a person in and then stop following up, expecting them to do their job that I voted them in place to do. And shame on me for letting that happen, right? Because I, as the voter, they're supposed to be representing me. If I don't go to you call their office, send them letters, send them emails saying, look, dude, this is not what I voted you in to do. This is what I'm looking for. And I have the people behind me saying the same thing. Well, then shame on me for letting that happen. It kind of loops back to what you were saying earlier. You know, you voted in the D or the R, the I, whatever letter that you stand next to. And then you just like went to Disneyland, right? <laughs> right. And, and, you know, I, I, I say it all the time. I say, listen. And another reason I got in this race, because I'm sick of the song and dance. The Democrats said it when. When, when Walker was in office, they come in Milwaukee and they told the people, oh, we would have did anything for you, but Walker stopped it. We couldn't do nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. The Republicans said, oh, we were trying to bring all these legislations up, but Evers vetoed it. Mm -hmm. So my question is, why didn't y'all call a press conference? Why didn't y'all call the Patriots? Because, you know, people love the rally. Yep. You know, why, why, why didn't y'all do any of that? Because as a sheep, you was told to keep your head down and just let's keep moving forward. Right. And, and we, we focus on the next election. See, my thing is, I was always taught as a preacher. If you belong to God and the door is open for you to go into a church and preach, give them what God says. And if you give them what God says, then you if, if, if they really want God, then you'll be invited back. If you they don't want God, you're not going to be invited back. So give them your best right then and there. Right. So if so, I, I take that same philosophy once I become lieutenant governor, because I am your next lieutenant governor. Right? There it is. I like that. Once I become your lieutenant governor, I'm going to give my best shot. But I always tell people when I start this fight and I look back, I expect to see y'all right there behind me. Letting the people know that we're here to make sure you guys taking care of us, that you're getting rid of Common Core and CRT, mm -hmm. that you're getting rid of all the mandates, that you challenge these companies to stop the mandates and or leave our state and invite the, the church, the, the companies in that is not forcing anybody to mandate so we can get our economy going again. There it is. You know, I mean, and we have to be we have to be 
the bully of this. We have to make sure, and I don't want to say the bully, we just got to stand up and we got to make yeah. sure that uh, they do what they say they do. And I don't care what side it is. If you're going against the people, you're going against me. So I'm there to represent the people of Wisconsin. There it is. And and I think I, I think you kind of leaked into something right there where it's like you don't want to say bully. I think one of the things I was thinking of it, uh, earlier today was we and I'll say we as a people. I know it's not me personally, but I know as a people, it seems like we have gotten to the point where we get so offended so easily. Right. It's like, oh, well, you called me a honky. Well, so what? Who freaking cares? I'm a white boy. 100%. I'm fine. I can move on with my day and just ignore you. But it seems like every time someone says something, especially in the political arena, oh, you've offended some people. And then they start canceling somebody, right? So if I offend somebody, I get canceled. I just, how do we fix that? Well, we just, here's the thing. I, and I tell people this, can't nobody counsel me. <laughs> And the reason they can't counsel me because none of them called me. God called me. Uh -huh, there it is. And, and so when I stand on the word of God, the, the word of God, God said this in, in Jeremiah, I mean, in Genesis chapter 12. I take Genesis chapter 12 very serious to my life because I am a seed of Abraham. So I take, I take what God told Abraham to my life as well. Right. So God and, and this is how it says it in the Amplified Version. Check this out. You're going to love this. He says, and I will make of David a great nation. And I will bless David with abundant increase of favor. And I will make David's name famous and distinguished. And David shall be a blessing dispensing goods to others. And I'm going to bless those that bless David, that prefer prosperity or happiness upon David. But I'm going to curse him who curse or use insolent language towards David. And in David shall all the kindreds and the family of the earth be blessed. And by David, they shall bless themselves. So what God is telling me, go do what I told you and don't worry about people. There, there it is. That's how easy it is. <laughs> yeah, that's how, you know, don't worry about people and, and see all our lives. The Bible says when the righteous in office, the people rejoice. But when the wicked is in office, the people mourn. We mourn so long that I want to experience what happens when the righteous in office. Right. Let's get in there and rejoice some, right? Yes. You, you know, so so when we look at, you know, when we look at, 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 at everything that's coming on, yeah, we got people in their emotions right now and, and, and they are, um, and they are running for office and it's good that they're running. Cause I tell people all the time, this is preseason. Anybody can walk up, do a walk in and, and say, let me try to make the team. So, but, but the thing about it is when your emotions come down, mm -hmm. right. The Bible said where there is no vision, the people perish. So when your emotions come down and all you want to do is be voted in and you have no vision for the people, then our people perish. Yeah. So we have to have people that have a vision. And we have to have people that have a passion for people and, and, and not the made up, not the made up passion. And what do I mean by the made up passion? If I get around a bunch of folks and the Green Bay area, Green Bay, Fox Valley area, right? And I stand in that crowd of people and I go, go, Pat, go. What do you think going to happen? No, they're going to respond. Go, Pat, go. <laughs> exactly. Now, I'm a diehard Pittsburgh Steelers fan. I've been that way since 1969. <laughs> so here you got a Pittsburgh Steelers that touch the emotion of the Packers fans and we all holler and go, Pat, go. Right? Yeah, 100%. So when you got people um, running for office and they start off with, do anybody love America? Come on now. We all love America. I love America. Yeah. <laughs> so, so give me some, give me some substance. Yeah. Don't play with my emotions. Give me some substance. Give me something that, that I, I can look forward to after this election that I know something is getting ready to happen because of the person we put in office. Right. You know, we don't want you in office because you say, oh, we, we just need to change the guard. Yeah, we need a we need a better uh, a better governor. Yeah, we need to fire Tony Evers. We all know that he's right. given us piss poor performance. We know this. But just to give you somebody that got an aura doesn't mean they're going to give you what you really want. Right. Because both sides, both clubs that I like to call them, mm -hmm. both clubs have their agenda. 
They don't have the people agenda. They have their agenda. And if we as the people would slow down for a minute and say, wait a minute, they don't have our agenda at stake. I right. heart. They, they're, they're talking to us what they think we want to hear. I don't want to hear about money. I don't want to hear about wasteful spending right now. When I'm fighting for my kids' future, yeah. when I'm fighting for my, my, my future to feed my children, when I'm, when I'm dealing with all of that, don't talk about, well, we're trying to lower taxes. Shut up about taxes. What are you doing about our freedom? Yes. Yeah. There it is right there. So if... if, if when you become lieutenant governor, I'm going, to, I'm going to jump on that boat with you. When you become lieutenant governor, what's like, let's, let me rephrase this question. When it's time for you to pack your office up and you turn around and you look back at that lieutenant governor desk and you say, man, I did a good job. What one or two things are you going to hang your hat on saying, damn, I rocked it because I did this? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to say to God be the glory. Fair and enough. The first, and, and the first thing that I'm going to do once I pack my office, mm -hmm. I'm going to call a press conference and I'm going to ask everybody in the state of Wisconsin to go on a three day fast with me. And after the third day, I'm going to ask everybody to meet us at the Capitol for prayer. And you know why? You're going to tell me, though, because now we need the wisdom of God to how to fix this the way he wanted it fixed. How do we fix everything? And we know what we need to do, but we need the wisdom on, and the strategy on how to do it. Sure. And, and I guarantee the moment we do that, those that are that are believers, but not bold enough yet, that's in office. I guarantee they're going to be at that prayer meeting. Yeah. I, yes. A number of their constituents will be there, too. Right. And here's the thing. We've been saying we want God back in government, right? Yes. Now, here's how we put him back in there. I'm going to say, look, y'all, we need a three-day fast. And then let's come together and pray that God will heal the land. Because it's all about what God wants from us. It's not about an individual. Because I can't take no credit because I didn't do it. You guys put me there. There it is. Now I got to fulfill why you put me there. Okay. So now it's God, give me the wisdom to agitate them to put the DPI race out of spring into November. So we can get somebody better with education. Right. Lord, give, give me the wisdom to go to them, to deal with them. Matter of fact, everybody who said they believe in you, God, convict their hearts that they'll meet with me to give the parents their rights back. So, so those are those same things that I've been saying is the same things I'm going after. There it after is. We, after the parents get their, after the parents get their rights back, after we get the DPI race in November, after we get done some of those things, then I'm gonna go in my office and say, not look at David, look at God. I love it. Look I at God. I, I, I'm, I'm one. This is who I am. I'm not gonna use God to try to get in office and then forget God when I get there. Sure. Oh, yeah. No, sir. I'm, we're going to do it God's way. There you know? it is. We, we're well, that, that, that's how the country became. It's it, what it, what it was in the first place was through all those men of God channeling that into the declaration of independence, the bill of rights and so forth and so on. We have just, I think so many that are, Sitting in those seats of power have, like you were mentioning earlier, have drifted uh, or got too bogged down in the swamp. And uh, I think you're right. We need to get uh, more true believers back in back in those chairs so that uh, God can start being heard once again. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, 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 and this is what this is what we're missing. This is literally what we're missing. When there is no God. There's nothing but chaos. What do we have? Nothing but chaos. Because the Bible says God is not the author of confusion. And we got confusion. We got division. We got hate. We got everything that God is not. Yeah. Too true. We, you know, we don't have no unity. We don't have no. I mean, since I've been out here from 13 years ago, 14, 15 years ago, I've been called every name. I don't think there's another name they can call me. I haven't been called. 
I've been called, I've been called a white nigga. I've been called it all. So man. So, but I grew up in a house with six brothers. So I've been called everything in the house. So when I go outside, <laughs> it doesn't affect me sure. what, they, what they say about me. So, you know, when you when you grow up in a house with six boys and you're competing, you're fighting one another in the house, but when you leave the house, you're unified and you're all together and you know, but you get built from the house, you mm-hmm. know. And so I was built in the house of God. So being built, when I go to the state capitol, I'm just going to pour, pour out what was built inside of me. There it is. Nice. And this, and this is why I am your next lieutenant governor. <laughs> there it is. That's got to be the title of this episode, I think, right? <laughs> yes. So, uh, David, uh, man, I just uh, I appreciate you coming on and hanging out with us. I want to be mindful of your time. I can imagine you have a number of balls that you're juggling. If folks want to learn more about David King, m- maybe your ministry, you have things going on in Milwaukee now, or just want to learn more about you and, and your uh, and your governor, your lieutenant governor race. Where do we want to send them to? Uh, we can send them to King. For F-O-R-W-I.com. Okay. They can, they can go to my Facebook page, David D. King. They can go to the campaign page. It's called King for Wisconsin Lieutenant Governor. They can call me at 414-676-0842. 414-676-0842. And that's my personal number. That is not a campaign number. It's that not. is my personal number so they can call me there and then we can uh then we can talk and um i'm willing to answer any questions that anybody got all right there you have it my dark horse friends and family dr david king now sadly hopefully as you could tell not hopefully but as you could tell we got cut off right at the end of our chat Thank you, technology. But luckily, uh, Dr. King had shared his story and all his amazing uh, insights and thoughts. Uh, What thoughts resonated with you? Let me share a few that I picked up on and I want to make sure get called out. Thought number one, stop bottling it up. Way back in January 4th of 1992, Dr. King, as you heard, found himself on that bridge here in Milwaukee ready to jump. A whole host of things had led him to that moment, uh, but you did hear him talk about bottling those things up that happened to him in his youth. Things that he should not have been subjected to, but was. These things that he tried to suppress rather than address um, the the resulting feelings. They, they led him down a path of drugs, etc. He even got to the point where he felt like he had destroyed his life. Now, luckily, Dr. King looked down and he was filled with the imagery of his daughter's faces. Now, as a result, he took actions that got him the help that he realized he needed. So here's my question for you. Are you nearing the the jump point? Are you at the jump point? If so, my friend, please, right now, if you're driving, pull over and reach out and get the help you need. Whatever help means for you in this moment. But here's a more poignant question I want to address. How can we address this long before it gets to the jump point? I mean, this is not a, an unfamiliar story. We've heard this from guests in the past. Remember Tiffany way back in episode four. Here we are. It's episode 281. We're still hearing the same thing. Remember Tiffany talking about back in episode four that she was going to step in front of that bus? Huh? I think, and I've been guilty of this, that one of the factors in this road Uh, to potential destruction, is that we spend too much time trying to see ourselves through other people's eyes. I mean, really? Who gives a shit? And often, more often than not, those people we're trying to see ourselves through their eyes, they're not giving us one one one-hundredth of the thoughts that we think they are. We give up as a result of truly being ourselves. 
embracing our uniqueness, even our weirdness, you might say, right? So are you truly being you, dealing with your shit? Or are you spending your try- time trying to see yourself through other people's eyes and heading down that road of bottling up? I want to chat more about this in episode 282, seeing yourself through your eyes, not theirs. Thought number two, doing something beyond you. Now, Dr. King didn't call this one out directly, but I want to make sure it does not fly under the radar because you will notice Dr. King, as he was sharing his troubled part of his story, it was all focused on him. And what I mean here was he was focused on himself, the drugs, the parties, and the ladies that were going to be at the parties. Yes, this was just one story he was sharing, but let's be honest. When you and I, when we tell a particular story about a period in our life, Isn't it pretty much indicative of all the things we were going through during that time overall? During that particular time, Dr. King's vision for his life was probably pretty self-centered around the pleasures he he could enjoy. But here's what I think he found. And I know it's something I found, even though we found it via Dipper Pass, the truth is still the same. Sometimes you have to ditch your current vision in order to find your true calling. Sometimes the very vision that you're clinging on to with dear life is the very thing that's keeping you from finding your calling. I want to share with you some clues to help let you know if you need to ditch or at least shift your vision so that you can find your true calling is in episode 283. Is your vision hiding your calling. Thought number three, if you come up with the problem, I charge you to the solution. This is something Dr. King's mentor told him and clearly has taken it to heart with all the amazing work he has done in his ministries, in his businesses, and now his run for Lieutenant Governor here in Wisconsin. So let me ask you, are you sitting there whining bitching, moaning, groaning about your problems, not offering or even researching any solutions. I'm going to imagine if you're still listening 30 plus minutes into a a podcast like this, the answer is going to be no. But just in case the answer is yes, let me leave you with this. You, my friend, are responsible for you, your world, your life, your relationships, your business, your work, your health, mental, physical, or otherwise. So the longer that you keep looking to someone else to come to your aid and fix whatever it is that is ailing you, then my friend, it's something that's going to keep you waiting much longer than you would like to, or worse yet, someone else will fix it. And now you are beholden to them, even under their thumb, even under the control for that fix, be it some agency, government, or otherwise, or even a person that could, and most likely would, use your disadvantage to their advantage, not your advantage. If you see the problem, figure out a damn solution and start working towards it. You, not your boss, not your assemblyman, not your governor, not your lieutenant governor, David King, not even your president. No, you. And thought number four, be loyal to yourself and your beliefs. Stop being loyal to some random group or party or location or business that does not align with who you are as a person. And, and maybe at some time, they did align and that's why you became a part of that business or group or location or whatever it is or person but now they're not over the last year or so it really i've really noticed it over the last year or so but i've done this uh, significantly across the my life but over the last year or so my family and i specifically have stopped doing business with companies that create products that we do enjoy but they have made comments or done things that are directly opposed to our values or the beliefs that we hold dear. Let me give you a recent example. I love a certain cereal that's known for its cinnamon crunchy squares. But I heard a rumor just last week, as a matter of fact, that there was TSP inside the cereal. I was like, wait, what? Trisodium phosphate in my cereal? 
But TSP, for those that don't know, is used as a cleaning agent, a builder, a lubricant, a food additive, a stain remover, and a degreaser. I personally can remember buying this stuff in a box called TSP uh, and using it to prep walls for painting, right? Just to strip down that wall of all yuckiness and dirt and grime. Right? And of course, this is when I was younger. Well, after hearing this, I went right home, pulled out a box of my favorite cereal and checked the ingredients. And there it was listed in the ingredients. And here's the thing, not way down at the bottom either, because you know those ingredients are listed by their content. So the number one item that's listed in your ingredients list on any food should be the most v voluminous content in there. And then each one after that is the next voluminous all the way down to the, you know, the minuscule amount. So there it was and not at the bottom, like I mentioned. So guess what? I am not eating my favorite cinnamon squares anymore. Nope. Here's the thing. One of my values, I'm not a fan of putting those types of chemicals in my body anymore. That is a value I hold dear. So rather than chipping away at my values just to enjoy a yummy treat, I, oh, wait, okay, well, if I'm honest, my wife, right, found an alternative, which I started eating this very morning. See, here's the thing. If you hold your values and your beliefs true, yeah, you're going to have to give up something here or there or not do something here or there. But you will know and feel so good about who you are that those things will be by, like those fallen leaves in fall time, right? That are quickly blown into your past. Hmm? All right. What inspiring ideas, tips, or thoughts resonated with you today? Whatever they were, take some time as soon as possible. Right now is a really good time if you can do it safely and write them down. Then put them in action. Get out there, run your race, get your results, and then come let me hear about them. Yeah, seriously, email me, tracy at darkhorseschooling.com and share the tips or ideas that you came away with, how you put them into action, and what results you gained from them. Heck, probably even bring you on the show and let you share your story. Speaking of stories, our next interview episode guest is Timothy Rantham. Yes, sir, the man that produces the Rantham Report. Now, Timothy is a former executive business management consultant who has served in vice president and directorship roles for multiple Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 companies that specialized in manufacturing, technology, finance, education, supply chain service and delivery, as well as call center operations. And right now, he is the tip of the spear here in Wisconsin on a hot topic that every single one of us worldwide, let alone in the United States, are going to hear about. Now, I know you want to keep getting all these valuable tips and inspirational stories from the folks I am lucky enough to bring onto this podcast. So please go on down there, smash that subscribe button. Oh, don't smash your phone. Just hit that subscribe button. And while you're there, give us a five-star rating and write us a quick review. Ask questions, tell us your thoughts, leave us some comments, some constructive criticism. I read every single one of these. And of course, do not keep all this entrepreneurial G-O-L-D all to yourself, share this podcast with other entrepreneurs and business owners that you know will get value from it. And with that, I'm going to leave you as I always do. Think successfully and take action. Thank you for listening to the Dark Horse Entrepreneur Podcast. You know Thanks for tuning in. Check us out at www.darkhorseschooling.com. All right. My name is Tracy Brinkman.